Sorry, guys. Here we go. I'm back. I appreciate that, guys. Um, we're using a new app with Bigger Pockets, and I'm just trying to get used to it. It's called Livestream so that we can uh, post this to several different mediums and people can see it in different ways. And somebody called my phone, and when I hung up on the caller, it ended up hanging up on you guys. So next time we do this, we'll have some of these bugs worked out, and we'll be able to do it on a computer so we don't have that problem coming in. But hopefully everybody is able to get back on and join again. I apologize for that I'll give you guys a second to get in here and then we'll see like when people are commenting saying that they're back in we can start up again talking about offense yeah it's a bit of a problem Krista because I can't see most of their comments like I'm only seeing a handful I see like four do you see more than that You guys logging back on, can you guys tell me if you're back in, give me a comment to say that you found your way back and that we're good to start up again here. All right, Matt Powell says I'm back. Nathaniel Dean Martin, thank you very much. Okay, looks like we're good to go. So as we were saying, your, your, your school, your education is not gonna teach you how to build wealth, that's up to you. You have to figure out what your boss needs and becoming valuable will earn you more money. I always hear people say it's tough to get a good job, right? But I'm telling you, as a person who wants to hire people and employ them, it is tough to find a good employee. Most people have an expectation that they should just show up, get paid good money because they're here, and any work that they do, that's something that like they should get a bonus for, right? I don't look for people that are showing up and saying, I want a job. I look for people that are showing up and saying, I have this skill set, I'm really good at this, and I can help make you money in these ways. What your responsibility is to figure out how you can help the business that you work for's bottom line with the skills that you have. Now, a big part of that is gonna be believing in yourself. If you have low self-esteem or you think that you don't have much to offer, why would anyone want me? There's no one who's gonna come along and say, oh, this poor person, let me give them a, a, a chance and I'm gonna to work to build up their self-esteem. And like, that's not your boss's job. Your boss's job is to run the company and do well and it's your responsibility to show them why you can help with that, right? So that's one of the first hurdles you have to get over is you have to believe in yourself that you have something to offer. Then the next that we've been talking about is actually offering something of value, okay? So let's say that you work for a, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say you work for a company that makes windows and puts them into houses, okay? So salespeople in that company, they're gonna call home builders and they're gonna um, go out to people like big commercial stores that might need big windows and say, hey, we improve your windows or we fix broken windows. Marketing people, they're going to be going out and telling everyone, hey, when you need a window that needs to be fixed, you need to call us. They're running ad campaigns and they're organizing ways for people that have window questions to get a hold of a salesperson. And then the service people, those are the people that are going to be like when somebody makes an order, making sure the order gets input correctly, making sure it's accurate, making sure that the client knows when they can expect their window to be done and making sure someone's scheduled to go install it. Okay. I would. I would recommend that most people try to find their way into sales. And here's why. The service side of things is more, it's something anybody can do, right? Most people can be trained to do the service side of things. They're not making the company money. They're just helping the company keep the money that they've already made. The sales side of things are things that actually, they have a direct impact on a company's bottom line. They're able to say, look, I got this many more clients, so the company made this much more money. When you have more of an impact on the bottom line, you can tie your salary to the company's bottom line. You could go to your boss and say, look, I'm closing more deals than everybody else, I should get a raise, or I should be on a bonus, or I should get a commission for what I'm doing, or I should be getting something extra because I'm making more money. It's very difficult for somebody in the service side of things who's servicing the clients to show their boss that they're improving the company's bottom line and they're making more money. That's one of the ways you can make yourself more valuable in a situation like that. Another way that you can make yourself more valuable is to learn a different skill set that that company needs. So let's say that you work for a doctor's office and you have people that check in the patients, you have people that go and weigh you and check your blood pressure before you go to meet the doctor and then you have doctors. Well, let's say the doctors are really, really busy there, right? If you can get to a position where you're not quite a doctor but you do some of what a doctor does, like your education's better than the average person's is or you pass tests or become 
you know, credentialed in something, and you can just be a go-between between the doctors, you can kind of be an extension of that doctor. They can do a lot of their job because they're the busiest people, and then you can earn more money. Now, again, these are not like specific examples where I'm saying people should go do that. I'm, I'm trying to get you guys into the mindset of understanding. If you're going to a job every day and you don't like it, Quit looking to real estate to be your savior for that situation. It is not designed to work that way. Investing is one of the three prongs of building wealth, and it's not the one that's going to save everybody, okay? you got to learn all three of these, offense, defense, and investing. If you're not happy with the money that you're making, you need to look inside yourself and ask yourself, what do I need to do so that I can be happy with the money that I'm making, right? This, in my opinion, we're starting here because this is the trickiest aspect of all of them because it involves the most change for us investing can be scary because yeah you can lose money defense can be hard because it means you're not going to be having as much fun but offense is the scariest because it means you're changing something about yourself or you're taking risk you're you're going out on a limb to do something that most people don't do but that's where growth is going to happen if you're the person who works at an auto parts store and you're standing behind the counter all day helping customers that come in looking for parts for their car, there's nothing wrong with having that job, but there's also nothing right with having that job. Like you're not, you don't look at it like you're doing God's work helping people at the auto parts store that you work out. That is a job you're doing to per perform a function or a task for your boss who owns a company and who wants to sell the parts. Maybe you need to look, maybe you need to look a little bit deeper into where you are valuable and where you can help out people, right? So for some people, that means going back to school. Maybe they go get a nursing degree because there's a shortage of nursing and you make a lot more money as a nurse. For some people, it's working on your, uh, your personality and your sales skills and it's getting into a sales job, right? Where you're selling an item that you, will allow you to make more money. For other people, it's just like getting over whatever your apprehension is and applying for a raise at the, already, at the job you have or a promotion at the job you have. And then if you don't get it, asking your boss, why didn't I get it? Most of the time they'll say you were lacking in A, B, and C, and now you have the roadmap to what you need to do to change if you wanna earn more money. I cannot stress enough, the amount of money you earn is very, very important. You're going to work every single day. If you're here on Bigger Pockets trying to learn how to build wealth through real estate, you also need to be looking at how to build wealth through your job. Get a better job, get a promotion at your job, get a raise at your job, or leave your job and go somewhere that gives you an opportunity to make more money. Yes, it can be scary, but we are smart, we have brains, we can figure out ways to do this that is gonna decrease our risk and we can make more money. Increasing the money you're making until you feel like you're at the maximum potential that you have should be your priority number one. Priority number two is gonna be defense, okay? This is how you save the money you're making. It doesn't matter how much money you are making. If every single time you get a raise, your cost of living, or sorry, your uh, standard of living goes up and you don't save any money at all. In fact, for most people, I recommend that you start with defense because it's harder to cap your spending once you're used to spending more, right? When you're used to driving a BMW and going out to eat every night and buying name brand clothes, it's harder to sell that and go get a used Civic and start wearing clothes from Target or Walmart and eat and buying your own food and making it yourself all the time. It's easier to do that if you start before you're making really good money, right? We're not all in that luxury of a situation where we can say, hey, I'm making a bunch of money, now I have to cut back, or, well, I should cut back now before I'm, start, before I'm making any money. I don't know where you guys are in life, but I know that making more money does not help you if you keep spending it. Every single time you spend a dollar, you are robbing it from your future where you had a chance to invest it and turn that into $2, right? The way that I look at it is that every dollar that crosses my path is mine to keep until I give it to somebody else. And that's really what life is, is we're looking at things like, well, I have bills. I got to pay this. I got to pay that. Well, guess what, buddy? You're the one who decided what your bills would be. You're the one that rented that really nice apartment. You're the one who thinks that you want a house with four bedrooms and you really don't need it. You're the one that went and took out a mortgage and you're the one that doesn't want a house hack, right? I hear all the time when people say, how do you save money? And I talk about house hacking and they say, I don't want to live with somebody else. Well, that's great, but that's your decision, right? Like if you don't have a right, you're not entitled to get your own house to live in on your own. If you've chosen to live that way in life, that's something that you chose and you need to own that and there's a price to pay for it, right? Like you're going to have not as much money to spend because you have that luxury. Every dollar we make is ours to keep until we decide to give it to somebody else. And you need to start looking at money that way. I look at money like it's a seed, okay? So I get this seed, and maybe maybe a better, it's an apple, okay? I could eat that apple, 
or I could take it and I could plant the seeds of that apple and I could grow it into more. Now it's not a perfect analogy because you can eat an apple and still plant seeds, but I think you know what I'm saying. You can either choose to gratify yourself by spending it or you can choose to wait and delay your gratification and go plant it so it grows up into more. Now if you plant enough seeds, you're gonna grow a lot of apple trees and you're gonna have so many apples you don't need them all. If you eat all your apples as soon as they come, what you're really doing is you're eating your future. And that's what I don't want to see. I don't want to see people that are like throwing their future away because they look at money like its purpose is to make us feel good. Most people think I'm making money and it's mine and the reason I made it was so I could go spend it on things that make me happy. Well, that's one way to look at it, but you're not going to have anything left to invest if that's the way that you, that you treat money. Money is very, very powerful. Compound interest is very, very powerful, right? I look at the very first house that I bought. I put about $50,000 down on it. It's appreciated from the time I bought it from 195 to it's probably around 425 right now. So that's putting me right around $230,000. I've turned 50 into 230 plus all the cash flow that I made during that period of time. Now I took some of that equity, some of that $230,000 out on an equity line of credit and I use it to buy other rental properties. Every single rental property improved my cash flow and every single one of them grew in worth as well. That original 50 has turned itself into over four or $450,000 by now in equity, right? Over the different properties I have and it's growing all the time. That is powerful. Every dollar that I made turned itself into four or five more dollars while I didn't have to work. I was going and working, earning more money, investing that money and letting it turn back into more. You can't do that if you're spending your money. That's why defense matters, okay? Scott Trench wrote a book called Set for Life and in that book he highlights a lot of strategies of exactly what you guys can do to live beneath your means, to save money so that you can start investing in real estate. A lot of people are interested in real estate investing. It's a sexy topic. People like to talk about this, right? Not a lot of people are interested in uh, delaying gratification or self-discipline. Telling yourself no now so you can have something later. But if you look at any successful person, they're doing this in some way or another. If you look at the biggest, best bodybuilders who have like the best bodies, they are not eating the foods they like. They are not sleeping in. They are not being lazy. They are going to the gym when they're in pain, when they're sore, when they're tired, and they're eating broccoli and tuna fish all the time so that they can have the body that they want. When you look at the very best business people, the most wealthy people, they're doing the same thing. They're taking risks that you and I don't want to take. They are making sacrifices that people may not want to sacrifice. They're giving things up now so that they can have something better later. And this runs all throughout like any form of success anywhere. Olympic athletes train for four years. They give up a ton so that they can be in their very best shape and go out there and compete to be one of the best in the world. The best professional athletes are traveling and training and practicing all the time. It's all they're doing. They give up on so much of life so that they can have that. Now, you don't have to take it to that extreme, but you do need to understand this principle that if you want something and it's worth going after, which I have to believe you do think because you're taking time out of your day to listen to me talk on Facebook Live, that you do want it, don't shoot yourself in the foot by spending money on stupid things. Don't shoot yourself in the foot by not trying to earn as much as you possibly can at the job that you have or looking for ways to earn more. When most people come my way and they say, David, I want to invest, and I say, why haven't you yet? There's two things that pop up more than anything else. The first is lack of capital. I don't have any money. That is almost every human being's problem in our entire country and in other countries it's even worse. People don't have money. The second thing is I'm scared, I don't know what to do. Now being scared and not knowing what to do is something you can overcome by being on bigger pockets and by listening to podcasts and by reading blogs and by talking to people. That's not as hard of a problem to solve. You can figure that part out. What is gonna be a hard problem to solve is not having capital. Now there's a lot of books that are written on partnering with people, low and no money down strategies. Um, it's all good stuff, right? Like if you can, then you should, but you're making it harder on yourself. If you just save up money so that you have money to invest, the whole thing becomes easier. A lot of that fear that you have, I don't wanna lose money, comes from the fact that you don't have any money in the first place. When you have a little bit of a cushion, that fear goes way down. Now you may think, well, I'm gonna make a bad deal because I'm not worried. That's probably not the case. You're not gonna make a bad deal because of a lack of fear, but you're more likely to take action if there's a lack of fear. And having a financial cushion, living beneath your means, knowing if you do lose money, you can go make it back and go try again. That's something you really can't like 
I can't put enough of a value on how much it's worth to be in that mindset where I have money to invest. If I lose it, that's okay. I'll make more and I'll win on the next one. And eventually I'll win on the majority of them and that's how you're gonna build wealth. So the first thing that all of you should be doing is asking yourselves, what can I do to earn more money? There's the side hustle approach. I could get another job. What I like to do is ask yourself, where are you not playing up to your potential? Where are you not really pushing yourself and saying, I am going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to go tell my boss I want to raise and ask him or her, what do I need to do to get it? That's playing like a big boy, right? That's where I'm like, I respect the people that are doing that. I want more. Tell me what you need to see from me in order for me to have more. And they may come back and say, sorry, the position that you're working, that's not a uh, problem. Um, <clears throat> At the position you're working at, we're not able to give you more money. We don't have any allotted to that. So the answer should, from you should be fine. What should I do? What position do I need to be working? What credentials do I need? What education do I need? What training do I need? What do you need to see from me? Based on my skills that you've seen every day, tell me what you think that I should be doing to put myself in a better position. If you're a boss and it's your job to make the company money and to keep everything moving forward and you have an employee that's coming to you and saying, I want more, what do you need from me? How can I help the company more? It is very hard not to give that person exactly what they want. And that's what most people don't realize. Most of us are sitting around waiting for the world to give us what we want. We wake up every day and we say, I wanna be wealthy, I choose to be wealthy. But we don't make decisions that are consistent with that. You can't say I choose to be wealthy and at the same time try to play in a small world where you don't take any risk and you're never gonna be rejected and you're not being pushed to your absolute max of like what you're capable of. It's like waking up every day and saying, I wanna be in really good shape, but going to the gym makes me sweaty and I don't like to sweat. Going to the gym is hard and I don't like to push myself that hard, right? I feel bad when I go to the gym. I don't look in good shape, but other people do. That's normal to feel that way. We all feel that way, but we don't have to stop with that. We can push through those things. We can say, you know what? That's pure ego talking. Why do I care what the person next to me looks like? I'm not working out their body. I'm working out my body. I'm going to lift the weight that I, that I can lift. I'm going to stay on the treadmill for as long as I can stay on it, right? I'm here for me. I'm not here for them. That's something that's really important to grasp. Like your ego may be what's stopping you from earning more money at your job. Your ego might also be what's stopping you from saving more money. You might feel this pressure like, I can't drive a used Civic, I need to have a nice car because the other people in my work have nice cars and I'll be the only one that doesn't have it. What you basically said is I'm willing to sacrifice my future wealth because of my ego and I'm so afraid of what people think that I can't drive a cheaper car or I can't wear a designer suit, or I have to have a purse that says Michael Kors on it because buying a normal purse would make me look like I'm not as good as other people. And you've traded in your future and the goals you have for the approval of a bunch of people you don't know who are probably struggling with the exact same thing. They're probably also broke. They probably don't have any reason to be saving money because they don't have a plan like what we have here when we're looking to real estate to build our future. And they're living for the approval of everybody else too. So. <clears throat> Getting honest with yourself is very, very important, right? Like I'm not gonna tell you guys what you need to go do because I don't know each and every one of you. I don't know your situations and I don't know what's best for you. What I do know is that there are things in all of our lives that are holding us back from operating at our extreme potential at the very best that we could be. And you do know what those are. Deep inside you, you know exactly what is holding you back if you're honest with yourself from why you're not succeeding at the level that you wanna be. Now I pay a performance coach that I talk to every single week and we talk about my goals, we talk about what I've done to try to meet them and he tells me, hey David, this is where I think that you're not following up with like the things that you said you wanted to do. Here's the reasons why I think you're not achieving where you said you want to achieve. Here's what's going on inside you that's keeping you from moving forward. So I've made like intentional steps so that I want to get the very most out of myself and I'm going to pay a lot of money to have someone who forces me to do that. We can't all have a performance coach, but you can have an accountability partner. There's no reason we can't go out there and find someone else who's also ambitious and say, look, let's make a pact. We're gonna meet once a week or we're gonna meet once every two weeks and we're gonna talk about what our goals are and if we're achieving them. And you're gonna point out all the ways that I'm not achieving my own goals or I'm not performing at my best. You're gonna tell me, you know, you do this thing and it always holds you back. I notice you can't take a compliment from everybody. Anytime someone says you're good at something, you always find a way to like poo poo that and put it down, right? Maybe that reveals there's a part of you that isn't comfortable with being successful yet, that you don't think you deserve it, so you're purposely holding yourself back. Maybe that person comes and says, you know, every time you get all excited and you say you're gonna do this, it's pure emotion. The minute the emotion's gone and you have to actually like put some grit into this, you just give up right away. You only take action when you're really excited. 
I need to see from you that you're gonna take action regardless of if you're excited or you're bored, if you're happy, if you're sad. The consistency is missing. You gotta do the same thing every day. Then you get to look inside yourself and ask yourself, why am I like that? Why do I get all excited and go spend a bunch of money on some program and then when it comes time to actually doing the work, I fizzle out and I don't do it, right? All of us have things we're doing that are sabotaging ourselves. What I want you guys to start doing is to looking into yourself and asking yourselves, what are the things that are holding me back? If I'm honest with myself, what is it? And then going and finding an accountability partner and saying, look, this is what I am struggling with. This is what I would like for your help with. Can you please tell me what it is that I should be doing? Now, what I find is that a lot of people realize this and they want to reach out to a me or a Brandon Turner or a Grant Cardone, somebody who's like several steps ahead of where they are in life. And they go to that person and say, hey, this is my problem. Can you mentor me? Can you help me? That really doesn't help you at all. And I think the reason a lot of people do that is they know they're not very likely to get help from that person. So it's a way of making themselves think that they took action without actually having to take action. You shouldn't be going to the person who's 50 steps ahead of you and saying, help me be where you are. You should be going to the person who's one or two steps ahead of you and saying, help me be where you are. And when you get there, you should be going to the next person who's one or two steps ahead of you and saying, help me get where you are, right? The person who just started working out and you want to start going to the gym more consistently, they're the ones that have the most advice to give you about, man, you're going to have sore muscles. This is what you do to fix it. You're going to have days you feel like this. This is what you do to overcome it. This is how you set up your schedule so you don't miss a day. <clears throat> the guy who's like a professional bodybuilder has been working out for nine years and hasn't eaten a carb in nine years. He doesn't really know what to tell you when you're like, yeah, I don't want to get out of bed. They're probably going to be really rude and harsh with you. Like you need to get over it. Because in their world, nobody talks like that. That's offensive to them to hear someone struggling with weakness. But when you're new, that's how you're all going to feel. So another piece of advice I'm going to give you is find someone who's only a couple steps ahead of you. Reach out to that person for help. Ask them to be your mentor. Don't go to the very pinnacle of the very top, right? Like if you're learning how to play basketball, don't try to get a hold of Steph Curry and say, Steph, can you teach me how to play? That's stupid and it doesn't make sense. Go to the guy who just started maybe six months ago and say, I want to play basketball. Can you show me where you started learning and how you started practicing, right? We got a little bit off, off track there. What we're talking about is defense and ways you can save money. The number one most important way that you guys can impact your bottom line with saving money is not eliminating the coffee that you order every day at Starbucks. I know that's a popular one, right? It's not going to be, oh, eat out less. Eating out, le eating out less will impact you, but is it going to impact you a lot? What you need to do is take a look at your entire budget. Look at all the money that you are spending every single month on whatever you're spending it is. Start with the very top things, the most money you're spending. It's usually going to be whatever your cost of living or your, uh, not cost of living, but whatever it costs you to live wherever you're living at, your rent, your mortgage, whatever it is, that's usually going to be a huge expense, right? Your next is probably going to be like the car you drive. And the third is probably going to be entertainment, what you're spending money on to have fun. If you're every weekend driving four hours away to go do something like expensive, you're always going to be needing money. You're not going to have much of it. It's funny, Matt Powell said, so I should ask LeBron because uh, Steph Curry's not going to help you. Exactly, Matt. Ask the guy who's just as good as Stephen Curry. No, you should be going to the person who's like not even in the NBA yet, but they're trying to get there because that's your goal is that you want to try to get into the NBA. Um, start with the top of your expenses, the most money that, or the most money that you're spending on whatever it is and ask how you can eliminate that. This is why house hacking is so important. I didn't own a home for me to live in myself until I had seven investment properties, okay? Somewhere in California and somewhere out of state in Arizona. But I house hacked, I lived with other people. I was that guy who gave someone else 500 bucks a month to live in their house so that I didn't have to spend $2,000 a month on my own rent. And saving $1,500 a month over, God, what was it, about five years was a lot of money. Think about all the down payments that I was able to make from money that I didn't spend on that rent. That's the way that people should be thinking. It's not just about, well, normally I supersize my meal at McDonald's, but I'm gonna not supersize it this time, right? Or I'm only gonna eat half my apple and I'm gonna eat the other half later so I don't have to buy two apples. That's things that you're doing to trick yourself into thinking that you're making an effort without having to actually make an effort. What making an effort is, is making sacrifice on what's comfortable right now so that you can have what you want later. House hacking is a huge one. The car you're driving is a huge one, okay? Don't just think about your car payment. When you have an expensive car, you've got like a European car, a BMW, a Mercedes-Benz, something like that, you're also spending more on the maintenance for that car. 
every time something needs to get done, they have to charge you quite a bit of money to do it. You're gonna be taking it in more often when you're not driving like a cheap import, like a Japanese car that just run forever and doesn't take very much. Maybe you're spending more on the gas that you put in there. You can't put the cheap gas in, you have to put premium stuff, right? Then you're gonna feel this, like I have a car, I need to dress the same way. I need to dress uh, appropriately for my car so that I keep this image going. And you're gonna feel pressure to spend more money on clothes. The whole thing steamrolls. When you get into a frugal lifestyle, it doesn't mean that you have to make your own soap and mend your own clothes, right? You can still buy new clothes, you just buy them when you're on sale and you don't worry as much about the brand that you're wearing, right? For people who are focused on how they look to others, they're not as focused on getting the most out of themselves. That is absolute truth. If you wake up every day and you look at Instagram and you're drawn to the people who put pictures of Lamborghinis standing in front of jets with stupid motivational quotes about how you're a grinder or you hustle and blah, 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 and you're like, you love that image of having a lot of money, you're probably not thinking about what can I do to improve my boss's numbers? What can I do to improve my company's numbers? What can I do to make myself more valuable? If you're worried about making sure that you wear name brand clothes and drive a really nice car. You're not thinking about what you can actually do to make yourself a more valuable employee. I don't care about those things because my goals are different, right? Like I wanna be the top agent in the Bay Area. I want to build a business where I can hire a bunch of people and give them things to excel at that they themselves are really good at so that they can do the things that they enjoy doing. I wanna own more investment property than everybody else so that 30 years from now when every house is multiplied times five of whatever I bought it for, I look really smart. I'm not as worried about like the, how people perceive me now. I don't spend nearly as much time thinking about that kind of stuff. And it doesn't mean that I'm better or worse than anybody. It doesn't really matter. It just means that my attention and my focus is on different things. And if you're not getting the results you want out of your job, I would bet you you're not giving 100% effort. In fact, of everyone listening to this, me included, I bet you 0% of us are giving 100% effort. Very few people are showing up every day and doing the very best that they can possibly do and pushing themselves to their max in pursuit of a worthy goal. Most of us, more or less, are coasting through life and we're looking for something that will come and give us what, we're, what we want without us having to work for it. And I'm here to tell you that is not gonna happen. If you want to make money, you need to be pushing yourself at work. If you're not in a position where they're ever gonna give you more money, you need to look for another job. You need to bet on yourself that you can find that and that you can perform at a higher level. Once you're there, you need to make sure that your standard of living does not increase. You wanna make sure that you're not spending all the extra money that you just started making because all it means is that you're on the hamster wheel running faster, right? Running faster matters, but only if it gets you somewhere. Running faster on a hamster wheel isn't gonna get you anywhere. It's just gonna burn more calories, make you more tired, and you're not gonna get anywhere. The last prong is how you invest your money. The whole reason we made it and the whole reason that we saved it was so we could invest it. You can grow wealth by making and saving money, but you can't grow it very fast. Investing is what amplifies the money that you've already saved. Again, making money doesn't matter unless you're keeping it. Keeping money doesn't matter unless you're investing it. You have to have all three of these things working. Earning it through offense, keeping it through defense, increasing it through investing. That's how you're gonna build wealth. Now there's many different ways you can invest in real estate. There's really many different ways you can invest overall. We talk about real estate here on this median because this is where people come to learn how to invest in real estate. So everybody who's here wants to be able to learn how to invest in real estate. Now there's several reasons why, in my opinion, investing in real estate is the best way for the majority of people to increase their wealth. Now if you're someone who has a very specialized skill set, like you're a brilliant person that can do algorithms in your own head and you can understand what stocks are gonna be going up or down, play the stock market, cool. If you're one of like the one in a million people that can do that, go ahead. If you have some rare ability to grow a business in a very short period of time and sell it for millions of dollars and you know in four years you can start a company, take it to an IPO and then sell it and make millions, then go ahead and do that. Very, very few people are able to make that work for them. They don't have the skill set. They don't have the knowledge. They didn't come from a background where they learned that. So for those people, real estate is the best way to grow your wealth. I'm a huge proponent of it. I think it's the best way that an everyday Joe can build their money, and here's why. When you buy real estate, you are making money in several ways, and you are mitigating your risk in several ways. <clears throat> Almost every other investment that you compare real estate to is the same thing. You are trying to buy low and sell high. 
If you look at all the other investment vehicles, Bitcoin, stocks, um, investing in companies directly, venture capitalism, what you're trying to do is buy something at a low price, wait for it to go up, and then sell it at a higher price, okay? There is always speculation built into that. And when we say speculation, what we mean is the hope that it's gonna go up and you can't control it, right? Like there's nothing I can do to control whether Bitcoin goes up or down. All I can control is at what point I get in and buy some of it. I don't like that. I don't like not having control over what happens. Real estate does go up and it does go down, so you can make money based on what the price is doing, but that's not the only way that you make money at it. Real estate makes you money in lots of different ways, right? The number one reason that I like real estate more than anything else is that it's of all these things we've talked about, real estate is the only one that pays you to own it, right? If you buy Bitcoin, you're not getting a check in your mailbox every single month from what your Bitcoin was doing for you. If you're buying stocks, unless they pay dividends, and even when they do pay dividends, they're usually super small, and they're not even worth it compared to what you can make owning real estate, you're not getting paid to own that stock, right? When you buy a house, you can rent it out, and someone's gonna pay you the rent to live there, and that mitigates your risk in a huge way. If I buy a house for $100,000, and it cash flows $300 a month, and the value of it drops to $50,000, any other investor loses money under those circumstances, but I don't as a real estate investor, specifically because I have rent coming in every single month, I'm still making money. And because of that, I can wait until it goes up to $200,000 and then I can decide if I wanna sell it or not. Real estate is the only asset I know of that lets you do that. You make money in several ways, but the biggest one is gonna be the fact that the thing you're buying is an asset that produces income. You're not buying it just hoping that it goes up in time. And the people who lost money in real estate, almost everyone I've ever talked to, in fact, everyone I've ever talked to, this is the case. I'm sure there's someone out there who lost money some other way, but it's very rare, bought a property that was not cash flowing positively. They bought something that was losing money every month based on speculation that would continue to go up and it didn't. Hear it from me right now, guys. If you are buying something, hoping it goes up in value, not understanding the fundamentals of what makes it do that or not really knowing what you're getting into, you are not investing, you are gambling. Now there's nothing wrong with gambling if you wanna gamble, right? Lots of people gamble, go ahead and do it, but don't call it investing. Don't trick yourself into thinking that what you're actually doing is gonna grow your wealth or that you're investing your money. You're not, you're gambling. You're buying something and hoping it goes up and selling it later if it does go up and then calling yourself an investor. That's not investing. So other than cash flow, you do make money in real estate through appreciation. That's when you buy something and it goes up over time. Now, a lot of us think we're smart because we bought properties that appreciated. It's not really us. Properties go up in value because of inflation. Like the government spends money to keep the, the whole government flowing. We spend more money than we make in taxes, so we have to de devalue our currency in order to be able to keep making more money to keep paying for all this stuff. The result of that is everything goes up in price over time. If you if you own something that's really cheap, like a uh, pocket watch for a hundred bucks, maybe it goes up over time, becomes worth one hundred and twenty-five bucks. You mean twenty-five dollars? But if you own something like real estate that costs a hundred thousand dollars, if it goes up to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, you just made twenty-five grand, right? And the pocket watch you bought, it doesn't pay you money to own it right? It just gives you time. The real estate that you bought does give you money to own it. You're making money while it's appreciating. That mitigates the risk that you're taking when you invest in real estate, while at the same time provides you with another form of income. So we've got cash flow, we've got appreciation. Another way you earn money through real estate is through uh, principal pay down. When you get a loan on a property, which most people do, a portion of the payment you make to the bank goes against the principal, the money that you owe them that's gonna be paid off, okay? <clears throat> that builds up over time. I have properties now that are on like 15 year notes and every month my tenants are paying off between 900 and $1,000 of money that I borrowed from the bank to buy that property. When you add that to the six or 700 bucks a month in cash flow it's making, that house is making me over $1,500 a month total that somebody else is paying for me, right? Like that's amazing when you get a couple of those where you're earning that much money through the cash flow and through the principal pay down. Now this amplifies over time. 
with every payment, more goes more goes towards the principal than what went towards the interest on the previous payment. And every year, my rents go up as inflation goes up, so my cash flow goes up even more. The coolest thing is my mortgage will never go up. It's locked in place and that's all it's ever going to be. While with every single payment, it becomes better for me. That's another way that you make money in real estate. Another one is just the fact you can use leverage, right? Like real estate is the only asset I know of that I can borrow money from you to buy this thing that you then pay me to own. Right, So I use your money and I take this person's money, the tenant, and I pay that guy back with this person's money and I get the asset that keeps increasing in value more and more over time. It's beautiful when you do it right. This is why I'm so big on offense and defense because I need the money in the beginning to buy the property and then it's done. Then my tenant is paying me money that I used to pay back the bank to borrow the money and I have some left over and every year that some left over is gonna go up when the lease renews and the rent goes up. And every year the house is going to appreciate and sure at some point it's going to drop and that just means I buy more houses like I'm hoping the prices drop because I can go buy more of them and then they're all going to be going up over time right and then the final way that real estate makes you money is in the fact of the tax savings that it gives you the money you make from real estate is tax sheltered in many ways right and you may have heard of the phrase depreciation depreciation is not your house going down over time it's not the opposite of appreciation which is what it sounds like right Depreciation is a tax phrase that has to do with the fact that you bought an asset that's slowly falling apart over time and it only has a useful life of a certain period of time. Now for residential real estate, the government has decided that the useful life of a property is 27 and a half years. So if you went and you bought a restaurant and you had to buy a new fancy oven that cost $10,000, You'd be able to take the price of that oven and write it off against the income that you made that year and you wouldn't get taxed. Like you'd get a $10,000 write off. Well, if they let you do that on real estate, when you go buy a $300,000 house, you'd never pay taxes on anything because you would just write off the whole thing. So they don't let you write it all off in the same year. What they do is they take that $300,000, they divide it by 27.5 because they figure, well, that's how long a property will last. Although it's definitely not how long that property is going to last, right? It's going to last a lot longer in most cases. And they let you write off the 127.5th of that every single year against your taxes, okay? So if you take a property that is like 100, I can't really do the math right now because I'm using my calculator for this, but you take whatever that number is, you divide your property's value by 27.5, and then you take the income that you're making and you can write off whatever that depreciation number was, right? So if that comes out to $5,000 a year, and you made $10,000 a year in rental income, you only have to claim 5,000 out of that 10,000, you're getting a tax savings of 50% in that scenario, right? You don't get that on stocks, you don't get that on bonds, you don't get that on money that you made from a business you bought directly, you don't get that on Bitcoin, you don't get that on anything. Real estate is unique in the sense that the money you make there is sheltered through these taxes for the first 27 and a half years that you own it, okay? There are lots of ways you make money with real estate. These are all some of the big ones. Now, another way that leverage can help you, and this might sound crazy to some people that aren't experienced, but I do this all the time. I bought houses, fixed them up, made them worth more than what I paid, and then borrowed more against them than what I put in in the first place. So I'll buy houses for 50 or 60,000, and I'll put 30 grand into it. So say I've spent $90,000, right? And it will appraise for 130,000. And the bank will say, okay, David, you have this asset that's worth 130000 I'm going to let you take a loan on it for 75% of what it's worth. And again, I don't have my calculator, but let's say that that ends up 75% of one hundred and let Let's say that comes out to like $95,000, right? Well, I only put $90,000 into it. So they come give me a check for 95000 and I now have a mortgage against that house. So now I'm making a monthly payment from the money that they're taking from it. And let's say that I cash flow 300 bucks a month on that. I got $5,000 more than what I put into this and it's cash flowing 300 bucks a month and it's been completely redone on a $30,000 remodel, which in some of the areas like the South or the Midwest is a lot of money. That gets you quite a bit of, of uh, product on your house. And because I was able to leverage it, I don't even have an ROI because I don't have the eye. There's no investment. I haven't invested any money. I've gotten more money out of it than what I put into it, right? I don't know any other assets you can do that on. I don't know how you can borrow money to go buy stocks 
And when those stocks go up, refinance those stocks to get more money back out, right? With real estate right now, you can get a loan at between four and five and a half percent, depending on your situation. And then you can go invest that money in the next house and earn 15 to 20% on it. How many other inv investment vehicles do you know that you can borrow money so cheaply and go earn it so much? <coughs> It's not that real estate is a scam, okay? It's that it is a boring way to very slowly build wealth that most people are not willing to learn or understand that you're gonna put a little bit of time into. People like Bitcoin because it's sexy. I bought it at this price and two months later it had tripled in value, right? I'm so smart, I have a big ego, I'm a great investor. That's why they want to invest in it. That doesn't happen in real estate very often, right? And there's a little more work that goes into it. You're on the phone with people, you're learning stuff, you're educating yourself. It's not rocket science, but it's more than just let me hit a button on E-Trade and then boom, I see a little number that goes up later or goes down later if it didn't go good. There's more work involved and that's why people want to end up investing in real estate. So I can tell you guys from firsthand experience that real estate investing is insanely powerful and it has the ability to change not just your life, but your family's lives for generations, right? I always tell people, my parents bought their first house about 33 years ago in Manteca, California for $62,000. Now let's say that they put 10% down, which was $6,000, okay? That house is now worth about $375,000 and it would have been completely paid off because they've owned it for over 30 years. Now, if they had bought it as a rental, the tenants would have paid it off for them. So what they would have is $375,000 in equity out of a $6,000 investment and that's not including the cash flow that they would have been making for 30 years. Let's say that that property didn't even cash flow positively for 10 years, okay? The first 10 years, it cost them money. The next five, it made them money, but that was just making up for what it already cost them. The next 15, it did make them money. 15 years of cash flow, which would be pretty significant, because I can imagine on a $60,000 house, their house payment was probably like 150, 200 bucks or something like that, right? Now that place would rent for about 16, 1700. So you're making, over a thousand dollars a month for the last 15 years on that property that has gone from 60,000 to 375,000 that you only put six thousand dollars worth of your own money into that somebody else paid off for you that is massive wealth and when you take it and you have it times 20 properties you're starting to see why real estate is so big now remember when they first bought that house Maybe they didn't get a great deal. 62,000 might have been too much. Somebody else might have said, I wouldn't have spent over 59 on that house. You guys were crazy. You overspent, right? $3,000 on a $60,000 house is 5% over what they think the house is worth. Nobody would be paying 5% over, right? On a $500,000 house, that's like paying 25 grand over. That's what 5% is. That's a big deal. But let's say my parents were stupid and they just said, okay, that's fine, we'll do it anyways. Do you think at this point anyone cares when it's worth 375, whether you paid 59 or 62? It's almost like, why even bring that up? It doesn't matter. That's the same thing we're gonna be thinking 30 years from now when the house we're looking at for 100,000 is worth 500,000, right? And whether we paid 100 or 120, we're not gonna care when it's worth 500 because inflation is taking the prices of all these homes up a lot. It is our ego that says, I don't wanna pay more than this. I need to get a great deal. I'm so important that I have to be able to pay less than the next person. And if it's our ego that's keeping us from buying cash flowing properties because we think we're not getting a good enough deal, even though they're making us money every month, it's our ego that's gonna have cost us insane wealth in the future, right? Don't let your ego trip you up. Don't let your ego trip you up when it comes to earning more money at your job on offense, right? If you don't wanna to have to go start at the bottom of the totem pole at a new position where you have a higher future, shame on you for letting your ego stop you from making more money. If you don't wanna go ask your boss, what do I need to do to earn more money because you're afraid they might say that you're not good enough or you need to work on something or you might realize you're not perfect, shame on you for having such a big ego in this circumstance that you're holding yourself back from being the best version of you. If you're not able to save money because you spend it on stupid things because you care about what other people think, shame on you for caring about what other people think and having such a big ego that you're hurting your future and your children's future and your spouse's future because of dumb things right now. And if you're not investing the money that you've saved in a market that makes sense, right? I wrote the book Long Distance Real Estate Investing because I can't buy in California right now and I'm not trying to encourage people to buy here. You can't buy cash flowing properties here, so you shouldn't be buying real estate here, period.
I don't think that it's a good investment at this time in the market cycle, so I go somewhere that it is. There's people that are afraid of it or who say, well, I don't wanna have to do that, I'll just wait for the market to crash, and they're gonna lose eight to 18 years or so of time that they could have been buying properties that would appreciate because they didn't wanna go learn another market. Shame on you for letting that be the case. Like, investing in real estate is investing in real estate. You can do it anywhere if you find the right people, and you shouldn't let that be your excuse as to why you don't do it. But the moral of the story is regardless of if it's a problem of offense, a problem of defense, or a problem of investing, you need to be asking yourself, what am I doing that is sabotaging my ability to succeed? How am I getting in my own way? Am I afraid that I don't really deserve to be wealthy and that's why I'm not taking action? Am I afraid that somebody might say, you're not the best and I'm like nursing a wound from 25 years ago where someone said something mean to me and I've been hiding that this whole time and I don't wanna grow and get over it? Am I afraid that if I get serious about real estate investing, I'm gonna to have to make some cuts in my lifestyle that I'm just not ready to make yet, right? I don't know for each and every one of you what's holding you back, but I know that the, the process of building wealth is incredibly simple. Very, very, very unintelligent people can do this very, very easily if they commit to the process. It is offense, it is defense, and it is investing. Those are three things that anybody can do. All of us, I believe, can make more money at the, than what we're making right now if we commit to it. Sometimes it means showing your boss you really want it. Sometimes it means taking a new job. Sometimes it means taking a couple steps backwards and put yourself on a better track so you can take a whole bunch of steps forward, right? But anyone can do that if that's what they want. If you're taking the time to watch videos like this and educate yourself, do yourself a favor and demand out of yourself that you operate at a very high level. Demand that you're gonna be earning what you believe you're capable of earning, not just what you're comfortable with earning, okay? And once you've done that, if you put in all that work to make that money, do not throw it away on dumb stuff because that's what you're comfortable doing. Do not live in a really swanky, expensive, uh, a luxurious apartment if your goal is to build wealth through real estate that is insane you're eating your future to be able to say I live in a nice apartment especially if you're gonna be going to work and working hard to try to earn money it's okay to, to house hack it's okay to live in a place that's not the best it's okay to have to commute 45 minutes maybe an hour into work because housing is so much cheaper and use that time to listen to podcasts to grow your education or to get on sales calls while you're driving to work and getting a head start it is okay to be committed to a goal that you think is worthwhile and invest Investing in real estate is almost always worthwhile. People have lost money in it. Very rarely were they smart people. It is almost always people that bought properties that did not cash flow, that they just hoped to go up over time, and they didn't know what they were doing. That's not you guys. If you're here listening to this, you're already taking the right steps. Understanding how to analyze a property, understanding what it takes to be good at this, understanding what a deal looks like, writing offers on that deal, buying a property, learning something, getting better on it, and go buying another one is the process of how the average everyday Joe can make money through real estate. Let's go to some of the questions that you guys are uh, asking here. I think that I can get off my soapbox now. Leah Setsema says, so glad you mentioned about your book. I'm in LA renting now, and I'm not sure how or if we can buy in LA now, and loved your wisdom. I'll get your book and get on it. Well, thank you very much, Lay. I appreciate that. Um, another guy that I know, Billy Maloney, I was teaching him how to invest in real estate for a little while. He lives in LA as well, and there's housing prices that are like very rough right now. LA is the perfect market where you should be looking to buy out of state, because it is so expensive to buy there. And that's a, a city where I don't know that I necessarily would want an hour long commute because that could turn into a three hour commute for some of the places that like I've heard traffic can be so bad in LA. Uh, Mindaugas says the Fed has been raising interest rates. Where do you see interest rates in about five to 10 years from now? Could APR go up to 12 or 20%? All right, this is a really curious question and Mindaugas does answer good, and ask good questions. He's often on these Facebook lives. We have gotten used to, in the last 10 years or so, insanely low interest rates that have no business being that low, okay? When the economy took a dump in 2010, the, the federal government jumped in and said, we need to spur the economy. Lowering the interest rate is the best way to do it, because if you're trying to get people to spend money buying cars, buying houses, financing anything, low interest rates obviously is gonna make people wanna do that because money's cheap, right? If you're trying to get people to start a business, giving a really low interest rate loan is a really good way to do it. In general, low interest rates help when it comes to growth. Low interest rates 
hurt when it comes to savings, okay? If you're a person who's planning on putting a lot of money in the bank and living on the interest, low interest rates kill you. This is really bad for senior citizens or people going into retirement that wanna live off of the interest of what their savings over the last 40 years of their life have done, right? They're getting hammered on this. Low interest rates also hurt in the sense that they are more likely to spur inflation, like what we talked about. The lower interest rates are, the less valuable money is, the more everything will start to cost, okay? Understanding this as investors is really important because it's easy for us to get in the frame of mind the interest rate should be in the 3%, and so when they go up to 4 that's not fair. Or they should be in the 4s, and so when they go up to 5 that's not fair. We did just see a hike. Interest rates just jumped up quite a bit. All the people that I have that are working with me looking to buy houses that have kind of been sitting on the sidelines, they went into freak out mode. This isn't fair. How come it took so, why did the rates go up? Uh, my payment's gonna go up 100 bucks a month. This is ridiculous. Well, honestly, they were the ones sitting on the sidelines and not taking action, right? So they don't really have anyone to be upset with other than themselves. They could have got started with this sooner. They put it off, they gave in to fear, they didn't take action, and now interest rates have gone up. The question is, where do I see them going? I see them going up, right? I don't see them going up really high. And the reason I don't think that they're gonna go up really high is that our government is in such a bad financial situation. It's basically the equivalent of, imagine if you maxed out your credit card and the payment you had to make on that credit card was more than what you actually earned at your job. So you couldn't even make your payment, right? So what you would do is you wouldn't get a second credit card to use to pay off that first credit card, and now you're building up a debt on the second credit card too, right? None of us could actually live our lives like that because people would stop giving us credit. But when it's a country that's doing this, people will continue to give us credit because we're America and we're better than everyone else, right? That's how we're able to get ourselves into this big financial problem that we're facing. Now, if you guys think about the example I just gave you, you would need the second credit card to have a really low interest rate in order to pay off your interest on the first credit card. If the second card's interest rate was too high, it would cost too much to pay off your first interest rate. You couldn't do it, right? The government has the luxury of controlling what interest rates are. So as long as they keep them low, they can keep borrowing on the second credit card, which is them taking on more debt, to pay off the money on the first credit card that they've already borrowed. That's why I don't think rates are gonna get like really, really high, because they won't be able to borrow. And if they can't borrow, then they can't keep paying off they can't keep making the payments of the debt they've already borrowed and we spend way too much in America compared to what we're bringing in on taxes so we can't keep the programs that people have become accustomed to having and if we were to get rid of them well nobody would vote for that president because nobody wants to be the person who says yeah you're cutting all these programs that we're used to that's basically the gist of where it's going now they have to go up because if we have another recession, the only thing that the government really can do at this point is to lower interest rates. And if they're already at rock bottom, then they can't lower them anymore. So I think interest rates are gonna to continue to tick up. I don't think they're gonna get into the 12 to 20% range like Ben Daugas was asking, specifically because now they have to borrow money at 20% to pay off the debt that they borrowed at 5% or something like that. And they won't be able to run our country that way. So they're gonna keep them lower because they themselves are borrowers also. So Fian says, what are your thoughts on networking and who do you surround yourself with optimal chances of success? This is a really good question. And it comes back to the point I made a little bit earlier, which is don't go to somebody who's like 15 steps ahead of you. That is not wise. Like the, you going and saying, will you be my mentor to a Grant Cardone who owns, I mean, how much? Like $500 million worth of real estate and he's running around trying to raise money every day. That doesn't benefit you to do that, right? Go to the guy, if you haven't bought a house, who owns one or two and say, what did you do to buy those properties? What did I need? What do I need to learn? If you're the guy that has two, go to the guy that has six or seven and say, hey, how are you managing all seven? Where are you finding your people? That's the key to like successful networking. Yeah, you can say, I'm gonna go after the big dog. I'm gonna go after the big fish. I'm gonna go find that guy because he's the man and I'm gonna say, hey, I want you to mentor me. And the mentor probably doesn't have time for you. You probably don't have much to offer that mentor in return and they're just going to be irritated with you for wasting their time and you're going to feel bad don't set yourself up for failure like that find the person who's a couple steps ahead of you see what they need how you can help them and how they can help you that's my key that i would say to networking like you shouldn't be reaching out to anybody to network unless you understand them well enough to know what they need and how you can help them right like that's really big when i go to somebody who i want like wow that would be a really good person to know 
I don't reach out and say, hey, will you be my mentor? I reach out and say, hey, what struggles are you having in your business? I can help with A, B, or C. Would any of that help you? And as they tell me what they got going on, and I think about what I know how to do, I look for a marriage where those two things can connect. Okay, cool. I have a bunch of resources in this area. I can help you with that. I go and I do it, and I wait for them to reach out and say thanks. And when they do, they reach out and say thanks. It means I did a good job. I ask myself, well, what else can I help them with, right? If you don't know enough about that person to know how to help them, that's not the person you should be reaching out to and this is just in general right as you grow you'll start to learn more and you'll be able to figure out what you can do to help the people that are several steps ahead alan said i do have a question when you are cash flowing when you buy you refi what happens if you were cash flowing when you bought but when you refi how do you figure you would still cash flow if the mortgage is higher okay so this is a good question alan what he's asking here is I was cash flowing when I bought, but when I go to refinance and pull money out of the house, how do I know that I'm still gonna cash flow? Because when I pull money out, my mortgage will be higher. The answer to that is you look at it before you do the deal. You go to the bank and you say, hey, I wanna take out this much money, what would my mortgage be? And you compare that to what your mortgage already is right now. So if you're cash flowing 300 bucks a month and you wanna pull money out, and they say, okay, when you pull out this amount of money, it's gonna be, your mortgage is gonna go up 400 bucks, you're now not cash flowing positively. You're cash flowing negatively, right? How do you figure out if you wanna do that? Well, you ask yourself, is it worth cash flowing negatively in order to get this money that I'm pulling out because I'm gonna make more money with it somewhere else? Or you say, well, I don't wanna cash flow negatively, so what if I take out half of what I was gonna take out? Go, you do that, your payment will go up 200 bucks. So if you were making 300, you're still gonna be making 100. Now you're able to get the cash you wanted and you're not cash flowing negatively, you just pulled out less money. Really, all of these questions can be answered by just looking at the numbers before you make the decision, right? You don't have to go into a bank and say, I wanna refinance and you just cross your fingers and hope that my payment isn't too high. You ask them before you get into it, what would my payment be if I did this? Oh, I wanna keep my payment here. How much money can I borrow? And you let the bank come back and tell you, well, this is how much you can borrow to be able to be at the numbers that you wanna be at. Colt said, do you own any property in Oklahoma? The answer is not yet. I don't own any property in Oklahoma. At some point I may, but so far I haven't. That is all the questions that I can see right now. It only shows me like the top four or five that are on here. So unless somebody else has any more. Oh, Tony, there we go. I'm looking to buy my second deal in six months. Seller financing is pretty much my only option if I want to do a deal immediately. How do I pitch to a seller that this is benefiting them as well? Okay, so what Tony's trying to figure out here is he wants to buy a house, but he doesn't want to get a loan from a bank either because he doesn't want to or because he can't, but he wants the seller who owns the home to lend him the money to buy it from them. So let's say he wants to buy this house for them for $100,000. What he probably is saying is, hey, I want you to give me a mortgage for $100,000 like you're a bank and I'll make a payment to you instead of giving you all the money up front. And he's saying, how do I convince them this is in their best interest? It might not be. And that's what you have to realize, right? Like you may, it, seller financing isn't right for everybody. I wouldn't do it. If you came to me and wanted to buy one of my properties and, and you said, David, I want seller financing, that wouldn't make sense to me right now because I'm in a stage of my career where I want the money so I can go reinvest it in something else. And seller financing is basically you saying you're gonna have to wait 30 years before you get all your money. By then it won't be worth very much and I wouldn't wanna do it. The people who are gonna want that, when you're saying how do I convince them it's a good idea for them, are gonna be ideally people who still need cash flow coming in, who don't wanna reinvest the money and they don't wanna own the property anymore. They probably could make more owning it by renting it out, but they also have to deal with all the headaches of that, like the work that goes into being a landlord. If you're able to say, look, if you give me a note on this property, I will make a payment to you every single month and you won't have to work, they may be like, you know what, we don't need the 900 bucks that we're cash flowing on that. I'd be happy to make 600 bucks from this guy and he can deal with all the headaches. Fine, let's do it, right? That's how you convince people it's in their best interest, but you have to make sure it's actually in their best interest. Seller financing isn't great for everybody. And again, interest rates are really low. I wouldn't want to give anyone a loan for 30 years at 5%, right? Or 6% even. Like interest rates could be 25% 15 years from now, and now I'm stuck with all this money that I've let someone else borrow at a super low rate, and it's not helping me. So you can't force somebody to see why what you're doing is in their best interest. You just have to look and make sure it really is. And the way that you explain it to them is, hey, if you do this, you'll get cash flow coming in every month, and you won't have to have the headache of fixing things when they break or dealing with tenants or dealing with evictions. So 
that's really the best that I can do for you, Tony, as far as having that conversation with them and trying to figure it out. If it doesn't work for them, go to somebody else, find someone else who's in a different situation, and do seller financing with that person. That would probably be your best bet. All right, guys, thank you very much. To recap what we've talked about today, in order to build wealth, very simple. Offense, defense, investing. Make as much money as you can. Save as much money as you can. Invest it as well as you can. Bigger Pockets is a great place to go to learn how to invest your money. I run a blog, greenincome.com. Green is spelled with an E at the end, like my name. Go there and sign up for the newsletter that I have. That way you guys can keep up to date with the different media appearances that I've been on or articles that I write. Or when I buy a house, I try to go on there and I put all the details of how I bought it, what I paid, where I found it before and after pictures so you guys can kind of follow along with what houses I'm buying and why. Uh, Tony, you're very welcome for the advice. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like you guys to follow me on the blog because it's good to learn from my experience so you don't have to basically go out there and make those mistakes on your own. Learning from other people is a good way to save money. And I talk about all these different things on there, how you can save money, how you can make money, and how you can invest in real estate. Don't get tricked into thinking that like, Investing is all that matters, right? It's one prong of a three-legged stool. You also need offense and you also need a defense. And I would advise that you guys spend some time researching how to make more money at your job or how to save more of your own money. Set for Life by Scott Trench is a great book where he talks about some of the big ways that you can save money on the properties that, or sorry, save money on the way that you're living your life. Jim Rohn and Hal Elrod are both people that I highly recommend researching if you want to learn how to make more money at your job. Hal Elrod runs a podcast called Achieve Your Goals. Brandon and I recently interviewed him on a Bigger Pockets podcast episode that should be coming out in a couple weeks. He wrote a book called The Miracle Morning and he endorsed my book, Long Distance Real Estate Investing. It's his name on the front of it. So if you guys are interested in learning how to make more at your job, Google or YouTube Jim Rohn and Hal Elrod. They have a lot of good stuff that they talk about how you can do that. And then Scott Trench is a great resource to go to for how to... uh, save money. And then my book, Long Distance Real Estate Investing, and my blog is a great place to go to learn how to invest in real estate. We will be doing more of these, probably one every single week. So thank you guys for coming. Please tell your friends about it. If you'd like more people to get involved in this, grow your own community of people where uh, they are also investing in real estate and looking to grow their wealth so that you don't feel pressured to be the person who has a BMW. You feel pressure because you are the person with the BMW and everybody else sold theirs. They bought cheap cars and they put money in the bank. Thank you guys very much. I hope you have a great day and we will see you soon.